for the second uh, for afternoon uh, sessions, the first speaker would be Kritika Prakash. Uh, she is a machine learning researcher in Institute of uh, Information Technologies in Hyderabad, and she leads the differential privacy team at OpenMind. OpenMind is an open source project that uh, works on, um, uh, as we know that uh, there's uh, always issues with uh, centralized uh, data and uh, that uh, abstracts democratization of uh, Data, uh, data mining and I don't know, Kritika will give us an overview of that <laughs> talk. But uh, yes, I'm uh, very happy to introduce Kritika, who I think is uh, one of the youngest and um, talented data scientists uh, uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, our, in among our speakers. So he just finished the master's this last year, right? And, I'm, uh, I'm about to finish my master. <laughs> yes, yes. So yes, please, Kritika, um, the floor is yours. OK, um, I'm going to share my screen. OK, it's disabled for me. Oh, hang on a sec. I think you need to be. Uh, Melissa, um, I wonder if, uh... yes, okay. can I... yes. Is it visible? Yes. Yep. And uh, my video as well. I hope it's syncing in fine. That's right. Yes. I think you need to put it in full screen, the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Uh, so I'm going to start. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I am going to try to keep it as short as possible, uh, definitely under 20 minutes, um, so that there's more time for us to just discuss. And uh, maybe I, I could help with any questions that you have. So um, I, as uh, Asel already uh, told, I am a researcher or a master's student at IIIT Hyderabad in India. And I lead the differential privacy team at this open source organization called OpenMind, whose main agenda is to be able to build um, secure and private AI. So I'm going to talk a lot more about it towards the end of the presentation. So just, um, just first, I'll motivate why this is important, and then we can get to more about OpenMind. So the agenda is we're going to start talking about why we even need privacy um, in, in the scope of machine learning. Uh, then we're going to look at a specific field of privacy known as differential privacy, uh, then discuss a couple applications and talk about the role of open source um, in this space. So um, the need for privacy in machine learning. If you look at the kind of applications that machine learning is able to solve very easily, that's something like, OK, how, what do handwritten digits look like? But the, the places where machine learning is having a difficulty in solving problems is things like, um, how do we protect, uh, predict if somebody can have cancer? Or what do tumors look like in human beings? And, and the reason behind this is not that machine learning algorithms aren't uh, good enough or aren't helpful in the diagnosis. It's just that it's really hard to access such data. And the reason for that is because it's really sensitive and private data. Um, this healthcare data or financial data, things like this, uh, not just people, but even organizations like banks and hospitals are apprehensive to share publicly. Um, and there are a group of attacks that happen, uh, not just in theory, but even in real life on, on the data analysis pipeline. Uh, one attack is um, called the membership inference attack, where by looking at the machine learning model that you're working with and, and for some data, new data that you have, by just running it through the model, you will be able to tell whether the model was trained on that data or not. And that can be quite scary. Uh, I'll give an example soon. Another thing is, um, you know, given a model, or given some data, we are able to reconstruct the original information in the data set. And the third thing is linkage attacks, where basically you take data from one ecosystem 
and you take the data from another ecosystem and you find these links, which can uh, basically reveal a lot about somebody who is in both of these data sets. So um, in fact, this happened with uh, the really popular case of people linking the anonymous Netflix and IMDB data sets and figuring out a lot about the people who, and figuring out exactly who be, who are the people in the Netflix data set uh, based on the IMDB data set. And these are just to show that things like just anonymizing a data set is not enough to, you know, to, to ensure the privacy of the people uh, in the data set. So one example basically is uh, if we are trying to predict whether, uh, like using cancer data, we're trying to predict whether smoking is a cause for cancer or not. So there are two levels of harms in this example. The first level of harm is the harm that's caused by smoking itself. And uh, this is what the statistical analysis or some machine learning analysis can actually help you. So if you're able to find this strong relationship that smoking causes cancer, then you can evident you can easily avoid smoking and you know avoid the harms caused by it. But the second level of harm is if you are someone who has participated in such a data set, uh, insurance companies can get to know that, okay, this person is a part of such a data set, and it's possible that they charge you a much higher uh, insurance fee or premium fee um, in, because they know that you are a part of a, a data set of smokers. So this is the second level harm, which is basically what uh, privacy breaches can cause. And uh, so we're going to consider a simple framework for like the rest of the talk, where uh, we have two categories. One is a set of data individual, data owners or people. Um, they're the ones who actually own the data. Uh, it's their personal data. And uh, we're going to have another category called data scientists who, who don't actually want the data, but they want to infer meaningful uh, inferences from the data, you know, like smoking causes cancer. So, the so a standard ML sort of pipeline or data analysis pipeline would look something like this: that a person named Alice uh, is a data owner, and she is the one who's contributed input data. Uh, this data is basically going to go through some query algorithm, and uh, what query algorithm it is will be decided by the data scientist. And the output of this query algorithm is what the data scientist Betty is interested in. So um, that's sort of the pipeline, data pipeline that we're working with. So what happens is there are a certain uh, set of privacy enhancing technologies um, within the scope of computational privacy. And they're all uh, they're all important for, for specific reasons. So um, I'll get back to the previous slide in a second. Uh, but basically, we want three guarantees when we're working with people's data. The first guarantee is that data scientists are not able to copy the input data. And the second guarantee is that we want to protect the query outputs from the data owners. And the final guarantee is that the query algorithm that we're using should not inherently memorize the data. Uh, you will see that this often happens in uh, deep neural networks. So we need we need to use these privacy enhancing technologies along with our um, standard machine learning pipeline in such a way that uh, basically neither of these violations happen. And so for that, here is sort of the broad class of privacy enhancing technologies that we use. Uh, remote execution and federated learning are pretty strongly linked. Uh, basically, uh, it's kind of like a distributed form of learning where um, you know there's not a single model in a single server. It's possible that uh, this model is going to go to everybody's phone to get trained and uh, come back. So um, remote execution is is I mean it's a more general sort of concept, but basically all it's saying is that. I should be able to operate remotely uh, on data that's remotely uh, rem in, in a remote place from me. Cryptography and information security similarly are um, strongly linked where um, you would want uh, either communication protocols or 
um, file sharing protocols or uh, any sort of data uh, tra data transaction or data um, operation to be happening in an encrypted manner so that people cannot actually see what the true values are. Um, and verifiable identity, um, you can think of it as uh, being able to prove that um, I'm the data scientist who, who made this operation or who says that this model is private, uh, for example, or um, in clinical trials, for example, where you would want uh, proof that uh, yes, uh, the both the uh, placebo uh, half of the of the people who've been tested on and the actual half of the people who have taken the drug, you can verify that that's what happened. So cryptography is also used in coming up with uh, protocols for verifiable identity. And finally, um, differential privacy which is a subfield of cryptography, which is something that really makes the process of measuring privacy, amount of privacy in an algorithm, and also um, adding or, or increasing the privacy really easy uh, compared to most uh, encrypted sort of computation-based methods. So um, yeah, on to differential privacy. Uh, it, as the slide sort of says, it is basically a process where you can easily share um, information publicly uh, in such a way that no single person's uh, contributions are revealed, but the bigger picture remains the same, which is often the goal of, which is most like mostly the goal of data science itself. That you know you want to make really good hypothesis predictions, but you're not really interested in the data of uh, any single person. So. Um, and and since this is sort of the gold standard of privacy and it gives a strong mathematical guarantee of privacy, it does not require us to try to model different attacks. It takes the worst case into account. It quantifies the privacy loss and we can even extend it uh, from working, like calculating how much privacy we get on a single queries result to multiple queries performed on the same data set. And yeah, so let's consider a simple example. Uh, where basically um, there's a restaurant and uh, within a day we're kind of um, measuring how many visitors are coming in at different hours of the day. So um, in this graph, basically in this chart, you see that there's nobody who's come in at 1 a.m. But um, if, if, if um, there was exactly one person who went into the cafe or to the restaurant at 1 a.m., then it's really easy to sort of figure out who that person was because it's not that they are in a group of people at the cafe, it's that single person. So somebody who's trying to, some attacker who's trying to figure out uh, who all visit this cafe. For them, if they're able to spot one person near the cafe through some other data set, uh, then they can easily figure out that this is that one person. So basically what differential privacy is going to be doing is it's going to sample noise from a random distrib from a distribution, um, and it's going to add the noise to this data set in such a way that the overall shape of the data set remains the same, but the exact values are not specifically revealed. So you know it could add a couple people in some um, in some rows. It could uh, delete a couple uh, a couple values of visitors from some rows and. Overall, you will get a good idea of you know how many people are visiting the um, are visiting the restaurant in a day, which time is the most popular, things like that. But at the same time, you won't be able to pinpoint and say, okay, this person visited the cafe at 1 a.m. So, um, and in a differentially private ML pipeline, what's happening is, uh, you know, you have your standard pipeline, but when your input data is a part, or when it's passed to the query algorithm you basically add uh, some amount of noise, which is specified by the data owner. So it's like, if the data owner says, no, I want my data to be really private, then you're gonna be adding a lot of noise. And uh, if they say that I'm okay with you know this level of privacy, then the, you'd add noise in proportion to that. Uh, and because differential privacy is a numeric quantitative way of defining privacy, it's really helpful to, analyze and understand what's happening. So 
Uh, now, this is slightly more mathematical. Um, basically, here the idea is that the worst case is when two data sets, D and D prime, differ only in one person or one record. And that's when we want to measure how much privacy leakage can that have, can that give. So if there are two data sets and one of them contains my record and the other one doesn't, then um, by performing statistics on both these data sets, some adversary can say, yeah, um, I'm pretty sure uh, Kritika was in this data set and she wasn't in this. And that's the thing we want to really avoid. So no membership inference attack. So here, uh, what they're saying is, if we have a randomized algorithm, query or algorithm, uh, which is operate, which we perform on data sets D and E prime, the distribution, the output distribution that you get, the ratio of those two distributions is upper bounded by e to the power epsilon, where epsilon is a small um, numerical value, a small real number, positive real number. So this this basically shows that, for example, here. These two distributions, uh, they're, uh, they, don't, they don't really diverge too much from each other. That's the entire idea. Um, yeah. So this epsilon is what we call the privacy budget of this query. And um, basically, this is what can be controlled. So if I want a really tight privacy, I'm going to allow for very little divergence. So I'm going to specify my epsilon value to be really small. But in the other case, I can give a very large epsilon value, and these two probability distributions can diverge from each other a lot. So um, how would we go about doing this? We would have to look at three things to add random noise to the process. We'd have to pick the noise distribution. It could look something like uh, the Laplacian noise distribution or the Gaussian noise distribution. And then for this noise distribution, we'd have to pick its parameters, basically say the mean and the variance. Uh, which define the shape and the spread of the distribution. And uh, those parameters of e either noise distribution come from the privacy budget that we can control and the query sensitivity. So the query sensitivity is basically how much the output changes uh, by small changes in input. So for example, if we're just counting the number of people, uh, by adding or removing one person from the database, the output will only change by one. So the sensitivity of a count query is one. But if we were to sum the, say, ages of all the people in the database, then adding or removing one person from the database uh, would change the output by the maximum age value in the worst case. So that's what the query sensitivity is. And both of these factors help to determine um, sort of the uh, amount of noise that we're going to be adding. So we'll just take like a simple code example uh, where basically, um, again, it's the restaurant visitors data set and uh, the number of people visiting the restaurant at 3 p.m. is 10, 5 p.m. is 13 and so on. Uh, now, since, this is, uh, since we are working with a data set which is measuring the count of the number of visitors, uh, the sensitivity becomes one, which is represented by del f. And let's assume that the privacy budget in this case uh, is epsilon, which is 1.09, uh, specified to being epsilon right now. And um, uh, we can ignore delta right now because it's another privacy budget. Um, and finally, the way, the way the mean and variance of the noise added is calculated is uh, the mean is going to be 0. And the variance is going to directly be proportional to the square of how sensitive your query is and query sensitivity divided by your privacy budget. So you'd see that the smaller the epsilon, the more the variance, which means a tighter privacy budget. And uh, yeah, we can use something like a Gaussian uh, distribution, a normal distribution with the specified mean and variance. And we basically add that noise to the data itself. And so which the, while the original data was this blue curve, here, uh, since we have a sort of strong privacy budget, the uh, noisy data is the orange curve. And that's what we're going to share with anybody who wants to uh, infer something from this. So um, that's the code for differential privacy. Now I'm going to move on to applications. So the first application uh, is a part of Open Minds library. Uh, which is called SIFT, which is really trying to do secure and private uh, AI. 
Uh, here, basically, the idea is that um, I can open up a Jupyter notebook, and uh, a friend of mine can also open up a Jupyter notebook, and uh, I, I I could have an access to a really important data set. And the other person, being the data scientist, can remotely, um, you know, ping or send and send requests to my Jupyter notebook, saying, "Okay, I really want to access this data, and I want to perform." Uh, an average on it. I want to um, scale it. I want to uh, use a neural network uh, to train a model on this data set. And I can specify, OK, uh, I, I can re I can um, approve requests, uh, or certain requests, and I can decline certain requests. And I don't even need to do this uh, manually. Every time I get a request from my friend, who is the data scientist, I can basically uh, automatically calculate the privacy budget of that query. So the uh, so like if the query is a count query, it'll it's going to spend so much budget. And uh, you know maybe I've already preset a budget threshold that okay I'm not going to allow queries whose privacy budget is more than 3.5 epsilon. And so it can automatically um, both approve and reject the queries that I get from my friend. And we have a working model of this. So um, you all should definitely check it out if you're interested. So uh, this really, this is like um, a POC in some sense where you know we're really showing that you can uh, you can operate on data without actually looking at it. Um, so based on this, what we're trying to do is a, a more distributed uh, sort of application where uh, we are using uh, federated learning and differential privacy together to be able to train a model uh, from the data of 10 different hospitals, trying to predict uh, with, like the average stay duration of that patient in the hospital. And um, since this is a very, it's, it's a special case of um, federated learning where basically it's sort of, um, Mod, it's like model-centric federated learning where there's this one ideal model that we want trained, uh, but we we're going to access hospital data from ten different hospitals, and they're all going to have um, you know rules that okay, I can only allow you to compute on my data without actually uh, while you make sure that you know the model is not memorizing. Um, so there's that, and of course there are um, multiple other applications which you can think of when. You get access to data without without actually revealing the data itself. Uh, finally, the role of open source. I guess the nature of this field uh, that I'm talking about is um, something that is promoting uh, uh, accessibility and democracy in this process, especially for important applications. So you shouldn't be surprised that uh, there's open source work which is really behind this. So. I'm a part of Open Mind, and it's an incre incredibly friendly and kind community uh, with lots of really interesting and talented people who are doing really interesting stuff. Um, but it's sort of in a more uh, solid way, you will see that we've got a 1.5 million funding, uh, 1.5 million dollar funding. Uh, so uh, about in the past one and a half years, it's three years old community, and it has people from all around the world. There are around um, 11,000 people in the community. And uh, what's unique is that there are a lot of researchers as well in the community. And you know we're actively publishing papers together, um, not just library development. So it's a really good place for people who want to get into research, um, but you know it's hard for them to maybe access uh, research at a PhD level or something. And uh, yeah, uh, I already talked about the privacy enhancing technologies that we work on. And you can see the symbols of the places we are getting funding from and we're affiliated to. And yeah, if you want to join the community, you can just sign up on slack.openmind.org and introduce yourself in the general channel. And you know, someone will definitely reach out to you to help you and everything. And if you want to learn more about the nature of privacy, both in a from a technical aspect and uh, from like just understanding the way it uh, relates with uh, science and governance, 
you could start taking these courses, which we're creating. Um, and we've already, we're, we're in the second course, we're in the process of creation of the second course right now. Uh, you could take them at courses.openmind.org, they're completely free. And that's it. If you have, if you want to reach out to me later, here's my email address. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Kritika. 